ఇక్కడ చిదంబరం బోర్న్ సైంటిస్ట్ ఈజ్ హియర్ విత్ అస్ అండ్ హీ హాస్ బ్రాట్ అవుట్ ది సీక్రెట్స్ ఆఫ్ ది రైబోజోమ్స్ అండ్ నవ్ ఐ రిక్వెస్ట్ డాక్టర్ వెంకటరామన్ రామకృష్ణన్ టు కమ్ అవర్ అండ్ తెలుగు అదే గివ్ ఏ బ్రీఫ్ అడ్రస్ అండ్ దెన్ ఫాలోడ్ బై క్వశ్చన్ ఆన్సర్ సెషన్ సో ఐ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ ఇట్స్ ఇట్స్ రియల్ ప్లెజర్ టు బీ హియర్ బికాస్ ఐ థింక్ పీపుల్ హూ ఆర్ ట్రైంగ్ టు లెట్ increase the level of science education and awareness of science and fighting superstition uh, that's really great work and it's what the country needs uh, so it's a pleasure to be here i want to correct uh, two things one is you know um, i want uh, i want to correct a couple of uh, misunderstandings one is um, you know neutron diffraction is not very useful to understand ribosome structure there are lots of technical reasons for that but it really has nothing to do with our work on high resolution structure the technique of small angle neutron scattering was done in the uh, late 70s and really abandoned uh, after that piece of work so uh, that's one slight technical issue the other is you heard about the four important years for you know indian science which are the years when indians won nobel prizes okay or people of indian descent won nobel prizes and i want to correct that impression okay because you know just a a few um, you know a short while ago i pointed out that you know there are a number of indian scientists like shambhunath day who did a uh, very important work on cholera and uh, gn ramachandran who uh, you know provided us some of the basis of understanding protein structure and these people did not get nobel prizes but it doesn't matter okay and uh, i i want to show you a short 2 minute video by francis crick who many people would agree is one of the greatest molecular biologists uh, of our time and so if you can show that movie uh, that would be good this is i think was seeing the structure no doubt about it at all you must realize that although you have to have a certain merit to get a nobel prize there's a certain amount of a of a lottery about it i mean there are lots so i have certainly friends and colleagues who i think ought to have nobel prizes so happen got it and i can think of perhaps one or two have it who might perhaps not have been given, given it you see so it's it the, the, the what's odd about the nobel prize is that to people outside science it represents a particular thing you either have a nobel prize or you don't within science it isn't that you have good scientists some of them have got nobel prizes some of them don't have nobel prizes for but you might say trivial reasons for, for example wigglesworth who's the the founded the subject of insect physiology he really ought to have had a nobel prize but it doesn't apparently come on insect physiology it doesn't come under physiology you see but i mean he's perfectly he's, he's at that stature and there are certain you could find other examples of people or you could find people who just by the luck of somebody got a prize and theirs was a too close a little bit too close to it therefore they haven't got it but to lay people on the other hand it is a sort of label you see and, and among scientists they they notice whether people have got nobel prizes but it isn't thought to be the overwhelming thing in fact there's sometimes a negative feeling that once you've got a nobel prize you won't do anything good after it <laughs> and there's a lot to be said for that most people don't do so much well after they've got a nobel prize they did before then because they're getting older i would say i think it's certainly true in my case the work i did before the nobel prize is better than the work i've done since but i think that i think that uh, again that because i think younger people do the better work that's one of the things you learn in science that the people from about 25 to 35 to 45 are the ones who are really doing the interesting work and the more intellectual the subject is the younger the age this is particularly true when you go to theoretical physicists and mathematicians they do their work usually very young and, and the more experimental it is and the less intellectual it is that then the, the often the work the, the best work is done later as a general rule rule but of course even that has exceptions okay so i hope i uh, 
I hope that this clip made an impression on you. Crick is one of the greatest molecular biologists uh, who's existed. And uh, I hope that his views on the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, uh, you, you found them uh, interesting. Because in particular in India, the Nobel Prize has become some sort of celebrity status. They don't even care what the prize is about. It's just about whether you have a Nobel Prize or not. But there are many, many scientists who have done great work who, uh, you know, as Crick pointed out, uh, don't have a Nobel Prize. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, science and what it means in some sense. So one of the things that people don't realize is that every person is born a scientist. And as we grow older, we stop being scientists because all science is, is curiosity and observation about nature. And when we're young, we're observing the world around us. We're trying to uh, make rules about the world around us, trying to understand it. That's basically science. And we, stop, we start keep on asking questions. We want to know, you know, why uh, insects crawl or how birds can fly, why the sky is blue. These are all, you know, very, very basic questions. And if you, tr or why we remember something, why people die, these are all fundamental questions. And as you probe them deeper and deeper, there's, al there's always a scientific problem in, in every one of them. But as we grow older, uh, a number of things happen. First of all, we start taking the world for granted. And the things we don't know, we just sort of accept we don't know. And we, don't, we stop asking questions, most of us. The people who keep asking questions and keep their curiosity, they go on to become scientists. And those who stop asking questions go off and do other things. So remember that we're all born scientists. And the question is how to sustain that sort of scientific uh, temperament in people, that interest in science, even if they go on to do something else. You know, my son is a musician. He was trained as a, you know, he got his degree in physics, but he's a musician. But he's still interested in science. He reads about science. He, he's excited about uh, thing. So you don't have to be a scientist in order to be interested in science because science is simply about the world around us. And so if we're interested in the world in which we live, then we should be interested in science. Okay. The other thing is that this knowledge, scientific knowledge, is nothing more than a rational, systematic knowledge of the world around us. It's never complete. Uh, things we believe turn out to be wrong. But science is self-correcting. And by that I mean, in science, there are no authorities or dogma like in religion or in superstition. Uh, what science has is uh, it, it's a set of theories or hypotheses which are constantly being tested by experiment. Okay, And if the experiments don't agree with the theory, then you have to modify your beliefs and your theory. And this has happened many, many times uh, throughout the history of science. And so uh, this knowledge of the world around us is part of our culture, and it's part of everybody's culture. And so uh, it, it should be um, you know, something that's promoted. The other thing is that because science has no authorities, and because it's based on experiment, based on observation, and trying to correlate observation with uh, theories, it's completely rational. And uh, when theories get made or even experiments, experimental findings uh, are later disproved, then the majority of scientists will discard it and move on. And this also helps to eradicate harmful superstitions. Now, there are many superstitions, but I should say in India, there probably uh, has a larger share of superstitions. It doesn't have a monopoly on superstitions. Many People in the West are superstitious. Many people in the West believe in astrology, homeopathy, all of these things which have no scientific basis. And uh, it's, these are not limited to India. But in India, they seem to be highly prevalent. You don't, in, in the West, if a, a leading politician seeks the advice of an astrologer before an important decision, 
They won't advertise it. They might do it in secret, okay? At least they'll be embarrassed. Here, you know, they openly go and see astrologers, or instead of, you know, thinking hard about a dec decision on a rational basis, they'll go and offer some, you know, puja somewhere, as if that's going to somehow uh, change things, okay? These are not rational things to do. You can be religious for personal reasons. That's a completely different aspect, rather than bringing it into something where uh, a rational decision has to be made. So science has the ability to eradicate superstitions, and superstitions are always dangerous. There's no such thing, I, I believe, as a harmless superstition, because they always prevent you from uh, taking a rational approach to solving a problem, okay? If you take a superstitious approach, then you're not taking the rational approach, and not doing something rational is, uh, in the long run, uh, is not uh, a good thing, okay? So uh, those are cultural reasons why everybody should be trained well in science, and uh, science, of course, is also the basis for all applications, including modern medicine, and including engineering and all of the technology that comes out of it, all of those have at their basis some fundamental science. You know, the laws of electricity were discovered by people like Faraday and Maxwell long before, you know, we have television and cell phones and things like that. Laws of quantum mechanics, you know, discovered long before there were lasers and semiconductors and, you know, integrated circuits and modern electronics. So, what I'm saying is that technology always has a scientific basis. Similarly, most modern medicine rests on fundamental scientific observations about physiology and biology, okay, so, and, and basic biology. So I think science has the potential to improve our culture, you know, to make us a more rational and uh, tolerant society, and it also has uh, the basis for uh, all of our applications which can help improve our lives in a practical way. And, and that's why I think that societies that help promote science and help the, to distinguish between what science is and what rote learning for exams is, they're not the same thing. You know, science is about excitement about the world around us, about observing things, about hands-on experiments, you know, to test ideas. Those are the kinds of things uh, that are important, and that's what uh, I'm happy to say that there are societies like yours uh, which are doing that. So thank you very much.